I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Sarah Colber. I'm with the Canadian Wildlife Federation's Gardening for Wildlife program. Dartmouth, awesome. Peterborough, Nova Scotia, Cole Harbor. This is great. I love being able to see all of us from across the country coming together. Oh, that's great, Carmen. Christine, Sarnia. Super. Well, while you guys continue to do that, because I'd love for you guys to keep sharing, and I definitely like to see at the end um, in the chat where everyone's from and all their different thoughts and comments too. But I'll just keep sharing a little bit more. Um, if you're new to Zoom and you're wondering even how to access the chat, just move your mouse and you'll see a black bar at the bottom. And um, Point Claire, Norwood, awesome. And also, I'm asking everyone if you can put your questions in the Q&A box. So at the end of my presentation, I'll then go to the Q&A box and I'll be able to read through all the questions there. And um, it's much easier than me having to sort through the chat, but feel free to continue sharing in the chat because it's always wonderful. Hello, Sarah D and Taryn. And, and just in case anyone's sending anything just to the hosts and panelists, make sure you click to everyone. It looks like most people are doing that. So that's great. Okay, let's see what other housekeeping things I have to share with you. This is being recorded. So don't worry about taking a bazillion notes. Um, a few days after this event, you're gonna get an email with a link to the replay, as well as any other links I can think of that can be useful based on your questions and the comments in the chat, et cetera. So please just share there. Um, as mentioned, because more of you are joining in, as mentioned, I'm Sarah Kulber. I'm with the Canadian Wildlife Federation's Gardening for Wildlife program. I've been with this program for about 20 years now. And um, it's always fun connecting with like-minded people and sharing with you. So let's see here. I think I'm just gonna get started as so we can stay on time. And um, yeah, so I, I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe Nation, and that I acknowledge the inherent and treaty rights of all Indigenous peoples across this land. And I always find this is kind of interesting how it does time with our program very well, because the Indigenous people have been known for eons to be wise stewards of the land. You know, respecting the earth, loving nature, taking only what they need, giving back. And here we are across the country in our own way, in our own corner of the country, doing our best to, to love and cherish the earth as well and support our, our wild neighbors and ourselves in the process, of course, too. So let's see here. I'm going to get started with the presentation now. So more people are still joining in, but that's fine. Okay, so I'd like to also say, for instance, for the photos, I'm very grateful to our certified garden property owners who have shared their pictures with us. Photo club members, which you might yourself be interested in, we have a monthly photo contest and an annual one. And there are several other people who've shared their pictures that I've noted in the presentation. And all the rest are basically mine from our wildlife friendly demonstration gardens that are based um, around our headquarters in, in Ottawa. And of course, you know, other pictures from around and about. So today's presentation um, is a little bit about the Canadian Wildlife Federation. There you can see on the left our turtle team doing some of their work. And then what is wildlife friendly gardening and why is it important? Why bother doing it? Then we're going to meet some of our pollinators, discover how to help pollinators in the garden, and learn about garden habitat certification and resources to support you. So the Canadian Wildlife Federation is a national charitable organization that's been around for over 60 years now. And um, our mission is to conserve and inspire the conservation of Canada's wildlife and habitats for the use and enjoyment of all. And we do this in three main ways, um, educational programs with youth of all ages and, and the average person like yourself through these kind of webinars where anyone and everyone can learn about our wonderful wildlife. And of course, working with policymakers to shape the face of how things are affecting wildlife and conducting and supporting research in the field. So what is wildlife friendly gardening and why is it important? In a nutshell, it is considering the needs of wildlife when maintaining your space or making changes to your outdoor space. Why do it? Well, wild plants and animals are our neighbors, number one, but they're also very important to our well-being and to our world. And especially now they're facing challenges and really need our help. 
there's a lot of benefits that we gain from gardening in this manner by adding certain plants and avoiding pesticides. Gardening and being in nature in general is proven up the yin-yang to support all kinds of levels of health, our mental, emotional, physical health. Our outdoor spaces become safer. We feel good if it's very empowering knowing we can actually affect the world near and far with these simple yet potent actions. We create visual interest that provides places to explore and discover as opposed to just one barren lawn. We've got little nooks and crannies and areas to, to add layers of interest. And of course, nature is so wonderful to encounter and to listen to and to watch. And the wildlife themselves provide services that continue to benefit us. So pollination is crucial for our foods. Um, so much of our food is thanks to pollinators. Our economy, it's been said about a billion dollars annually is from pollination. Uh, wild spaces benefit. Um, and of course at home, you know, if you've got like different plants that you grow in your veggie garden and herbs, thanks to pollinators, they get, they get pollinated and you get the, the fruits of your labor. Pest control is of course very key to a lot of our different creatures help with pest control, including some of our pollinators. You might uh, be curious to find out. I'll get to that in a minute. And of course, even small animals like invertebrates and microorganisms in the soil, that's another habitat into itself. And they're so critical to breaking down materials from organic matter and stones and pebbles and such to make nutrients available in the soil for our plants to thrive. This kind of gardening is also really important because our pollinators, as well as other wildlife, but pollinators is our focus right now, face multiple threats. So pesticide use is a huge one, habitat loss or degradation, invasive species pushing out their native species of their natural food supply, for instance, competition and spread of diseases for management bees even. So through our gardening activities, we can positively affect the world near and far, supporting the nature we love and need, all with very simple choices. And together our gardens create corridors and connections with larger natural areas and each other, giving our wildlife a chance in these changing times. So Doug Tallamy, if you're not familiar with him, I highly recommend you check out his work and perhaps I can include a link in, in the follow-up email. He's a researcher, an author, a professor, and he says in one of his books how gardeners have become important players in the management of our nation's wildlife. It is now within the power of individual gardeners to do something that we all dream of doing to make a difference. Now, what exactly is pollination? I bet most of you know, but I've learned never to take anything for granted. And so I just to share that pollination is the transfer of pollen from one flower to another. And thanks to that, the flower gets fertilized and then we get roots, nuts, and seeds. And, and our pollinators do this because they're basically going to get the pollen and nectar for themselves and they inadvertently get pollen on themselves um, that then gets dropped off and spread to other flowers when they visit them. Okay, so now one of my favorite parts, we get to meet our pollinators. They're so beautiful, so diverse, so fascinating. We have seven main groups in Canada. Bees and flies are the top two groups, um, and we'll get to that in a minute. Butterflies and moths also help wasps. Uh, the top left are very important too, as well as beetles and hummingbirds. So starting with bees. It is believed we have over 900 native species of bees in Canada. Now the honeybee, which we're all familiar with, is not native, it's from Europe and it's farmed. Um, so we're focusing on our native bees. And as you can see from this slide alone, they're so diverse with their shapes and their colors. On the top, we have different species of bumblebees. I mean, yes, we've got more than one species of bumblebee. And on the bottom left is one of our sweat bees. In the middle, it's a mason bee. And it looks a bit like a house fly, don't you think? Like if some of these bees were flying past you, you may not actually necessarily think it was a bee right away. And on the bottom right, we've got a bumblebee on the wild rose with um, one of our hoverflies on the top rose. And I can add actually the flowers in case you're interested. Going clockwise, it's Culver's root, Gaiardia with the yellow and the, the red. Um, then it's the wild roses, and then it's a flea bane. And then here's more flea bane and one of our liatris. And these bees are um, believe leaf cutter bees. They collect the pollen on their abdomens and you can often spot them because they tip their abdomen up when they're feeding. And this is another bee, I believe it's an Andrina bee. And I couldn't choose, decide which picture to share with you because I thought they were both really cool. So there you go, you get both of them. And you can see perhaps in the one on the right more how um, the pollen is collected on, on the legs. And here, pictures of two different golden rods and there's a bumblebee on the left one. 
And I just think it's beautiful to show the beautiful wing structure. And that's one of our bumblebees. And then another bee on the right is actually a super teeny, teeny, tiny bee. I was using a, um, you know, a, a lens that allowed me to zoom right in on it and, and enlarge it. And um, if you don't look carefully and closely, it's amazing what, you know, what we're missing. You might even just think it's just a regular fly, but it's actually a bee. And here's another teeny tiny bee pollinating our bloodroot in our wild woodland garden. And I just watched it go all the way around the, uh, the, the, uh, the flower gathering the pollen. And this is in my garden. This is a basil plant. And whenever I grow herbs, I like to leave a portion of the herbs to go to flower. And that helps the pollinators. It also helps me because then I get seeds which I can harvest and use the following year to grow the same plants. And I can also leave some for the birds to eat too. And you can see just this tiny little guy just checking it out before it goes in. Um, I should back up a bit too actually about bees. One important point um, which we'll get to later in terms of the, the shelter and the nesting. Bees um, are divided into two categories generally speaking. Social like the honeybee and the bumblebee that have a hive to protect. Um, then there's solitary bees, solitary bees to different degrees, where they basically mate, they lay eggs, they provision their eggs with food, they seal off the nest, and then they, they often die. So they do not have a hive that they are invested in protecting. And so most of them maybe don't want to sting you. If they have a stinger, it's usually too weak to penetrate your skin, so they don't even have stingers at all. So a lot of our bees, are very safe to be around because I know different people have concerns and, and understandably so. Their sting can, can hurt and some people actually, you know, become quite unwell from them. But FYI, a lot of our bees are solitary and, um, and are very gentle. So flies are another category, very important um, in Canada. And I wanted to show you, to help you see the difference between flies and bees, because a lot of our flies look a lot like bees. Some of them even look like wasps, quite frankly, but um, here you see one on the left, it's a, one of our hoverflies, and it's on our button bush, a shrub that we have in our demonstration gardens, and on the right is one of our bumblebees. And so you can see uh, some of the differences. For me, the eyes of flies are that much larger, they take up that much more space on the head, and, and they usually come closer together at the front. And um, the bees still have large eyes, and they're elongated, but they're not quite as, um, as, as much space on the head. The bees also have longer antenna typically, and you'll see that bees, most bees, not all, because some bees are like cuckoo bees, they don't, they don't do the, they gather the pollen on their bodies, but they will, most bees have pollen on their bodies, either in a pollen ball or on their abdomen, as you saw with the leaf cutter bees. So perhaps I can just help you start to notice some differences. Here are two more, again, a fly on the left, another one of our hoverflies and a bee on the right. Again, a hoverfly on the left, another kind, and then two more bees on the right. And again, such diversity with our bees, they're incredible. The one on the top right was um, on an obedient plant in our garden, and it was aware of me and watching me while I was taking pictures, and it was being very careful and cautious, just staying in the flower until it felt safe to fly off. It's quite neat to see them you know, be aware of me and, and interact. More flies, more little flower flies. Now these ones are so tiny, they're extremely tiny. The flower on the left is a miter wart. It is extremely tiny, just a few millimeters wide. And so this is when you really have to not only stop and smell the roses, but stop and you know look up close at the beautiful flowers that are under your nose. The flowers are kind of like snowflakes, but you wouldn't really notice it if you're just walking by. Um, the top right is actually on an oregano or marjoram plant and the leaves are, are fairly small, and so you can imagine how small that little guy is. And hoverflies, they have different names. They're hoverflies, also called flower flies, also called surfeit flies. They're a really big group of pollinating flies. There are others, but these are the ones I've really focused on. And in case you're wondering why they're called hoverflies, it's because if you've had a little guy, does it have come, they kind of hover in front of your face? They're curious, and they're quite sweet. And then there's a fly on one of our jewel weed flowers which is a great plant if ever you get stung by um, poison, oh, you get stung, if ever you get poison ivy, you can put the jewelweed uh, sap from the stem on you right away. Most likely you will not have any irritation, but you gotta get it on you right away for it to work. Okay, next category, beetles. Now, three of these pictures are of, it's called a firefly. They're not really flies, they're beetles. And the two on the left are, uh, was from a garden and they're 
in um, clumps of grass. I have some tall grasses in my garden and um, fireflies are known to like tall grasses to perch on. And it also helps with the moisture, they like moisture. And then there's another beetle on the bottom right, but I don't know what it is, but it's on a flea vein. Butterflies are another group of pollinators. On the left and in the middle are different species of swallowtails. On the right is a red admiral. And um, you can actually see some other pollinators in some of those pictures as well. We all know the monarch, the famous monarch. Um, and there's a milkweed in the middle there because without the milkweed leaves, the monarchs you know, can't thrive. Wasps are another category. And I know people really don't like wasps. You hear the, the word wasp and you get you know, unhappy feelings inside you. You, you feel, feel worried or, or um, you just don't like them. And I get it because I've been stung by wasp once too. But like bees, so many species of wasps, in fact, perhaps most species of wasps that we have are solitary, in which case they do the same thing. They mate, they lay eggs, they provision them with food, they seal off the nest and they're done. And their stinger has been, it is sort of evolved to become something that immobilizes prey rather than stinging us. So while bees gather nectar and pollen for their young, wasps gather mm, live prey like insects, like caterpillars and katydids and other things. And then they fly them to the nest. They mobilize them with their stinger, fly them to the nest, leave them there for when they're, they're young hatch, then they can feed off them. Sometimes they actually insert their eggs into the prey themselves. Um, but so anyway, they're actually, when I mentioned pest control earlier, this is kind of another, um, great feature about these pollinators, they're, they're, they're helping us with the pest control too. In fact, our agricultural industry is looking at how we can support them because not only do they help pollinate, but they actually help take care of a lot of our potential pest species. So I just wanna thank Sandra Garland with the Fletcher Wildlife Garden, which is with the Ottawa Field Naturalist Club. She's also with the Wild Pollinator Partners and I highly recommend you check out their website. They've got some great information. That's an isodontia wasp, I'm told. And they're kind of recognizable by after sealing their nest off, they use um, dried grasses. So you can kind of kind of tell from that look. And then of course, there's a regular um, wasp on the right. Uh, but again, I got up right up close to it, taking pictures of it. It was peacefully gathering its food. I was peacefully taking pictures. I wasn't a threat. So it had no intention of stinging me. If I was to go really close to its hive, that might be another story. But even in my garden, I remember with my daughter having, um, uh, uh, paper wasp nests in the tree nearby and even high up on the, in the eaves of the house. And my daughter and I would play and run around and we'd be perfectly fine because they were far enough out of reach that we would never a threat. But of course, when one started making one around my doorway, that was another matter. I had to take that down and um, put it way, way, way away from the house. Um, I ran really fast when I did that. Um, so it is possible to live peacefully. I remember sometimes even the paper wasps would come to um, where I'm sitting on my front steps and would come to, to the, the, the handrail and, and would scrape some of the, the wood off for its nest right next to me. And we were completely peaceful because it knew it wasn't a threat. That said, I totally get if you have concerns, obviously honor that, take care of yourself, safety is number one. But wasps are pretty cool and it is possible to live peacefully with them for the most part, I believe. Moths are another group of pollinators and some of our moths, um, like the luna moth, for instance, the very big, beautiful green one that we see, they don't actually feed as adults. Some moths don't feed as adults, but uh, here's a beautiful hummingbird clearing moth. We've got, I think, uh, three species of, of uh, clearing moths in Canada, and they're lovely. They hover in front of flowers like a hummingbird does, which is why they get their name that way. And, um, and they're quite wonderful to see if you get the chance to see them in your garden. Hummingbirds are um, another group of pollinators. Again, not quite as efficient as bees and flies, et cetera, but they definitely do some pollination. And um, on the left and bottom are a couple of our Western species, the rufus and the annas, I believe. And the annas is at the red flower current. And then on the top right is, um, I believe, a ruby throated hummingbird. And it's at um, a zinnia plant. And zinnias aren't native but they are considered beneficial annuals, especially if you get the heirloom kind like these where they're not a bazillion layers of petals. They're actually just sort of like a, a single thin layer of petals. So it's still lots of fertile flowers in the middle for the, the um, pollinator to access. Okay, so those were our groups of pollinators. Now I'm gonna talk about how to help pollinators in the garden. So the main categories are food, water, and shelter. 
just like us. They have habitat elements that, that, that they need, um, plus green gardening practices, in particular avoiding pesticides, because once you've got all these wonderful elements and you're supporting them and attracting them, you need to make sure that their food and they themselves are safe in your space. And I'm sure you all do this to different degrees, but we'll explore different ways to, to do this um, in case you get more ideas. So the first category food, nectar and pollen is the biggest one because we're talking about pollinators. And I'm gonna go off on a bit of a tangent here because it's a fair bit to say. So on the left, we've got um, one of our native lupins and on the right is an obedient plant. Now, when it comes to buying or adding plants to your garden, I would encourage you to think about avoiding those that are overly cultivated or even hybridized to the point where they're sterile or they have very little nectar and pollen. Some cultivated plants are just great and fine. It's just a matter of being aware and doing your research. So for instance, um, a lot of our flowers we think of as a flower, but in fact, it's like, it's a flower head and there's lots and lots of little, little flowers. So think of sunflowers, for instance, or asters. The whole center is full of lots of tiny little inconspicuous fertile flowers um, that will later make seeds once they're pollinated. And around the edge, you've got the, the, the flowers that have got the petal structure. And um, what's happened sometimes with cultivation is they replace the inconspicuous fertile ones in the middle with the showy petal-like structures. And so you get these pom-pom-like things that are meant to be you know, for pleasing to our eye, but they no longer have any or enough uh, pollen and nectar. So our pollinators have to work harder or not even work harder going from flower to flower to get, to get enough of their food, but also because there's so many petals, they sometimes have to work harder to find it. Depends on the kind of plant we're talking about. Um, but just do, you know, do your research. So one hybrid of one of our native plants and, and then European species, and it is an, actually a sterile plant. So it's just a matter of doing your research. And people have said, well, how do I find out? It's a very good question. You can ask at the nursery and sometimes they'll know and sometimes they won't. You can do some research online. You can also actually, if you're in a nursery where, you know, they're in flower and it's open air, look to see if there are pollinators. I remember one time I was at a nursery and there were many kinds of echinacea on the table and I could see which ones the pollinators were going to and they weren't just like going looking and then leaving they were going and looked like they were feeding and then there was one kind where they, they were not going to it and I thought hmm, I guess I'm not going to buy that kind so I just, just do some research and keep that in mind. Plants grown with neonicotinoids are also things to avoid their pollen and nectar from these plants can harm pollinators because the neonicotinoids are a very tenacious group of pesticides and when they're sprayed on the seed it can impact you know, farther down on the line than the plant's growth. And I know with my local nursery, I asked them, you know, or do you use nicotinoids? And they don't, but they also make sure that the seeds they buy for when they grow in their greenhouses also do not have, the way they were not treated with neonex. So it's important to think about. And even if your nursery does not know, if the staff don't know, by asking it's helping to raise awareness. So that's kind of cool. And we can help shape um, the industry I have seen it, I have heard of it, that you know our consumer demand is actually impacting what growers do. Uh, on that note, the Canadian Wildlife Federation does have a series of new neck free plant kits sold at many of the Home Depot uh, stores across the country. Look for them around Mother's Day is when they typically come out. Another thing to avoid are invasive plants from other places that can spread quickly and wipe out native plants in other natural areas. Okay, that said, now what to include? So there's flowers of different shapes and sizes because you saw how varied our pollinators are in their sizes, they are in their behavior in the times of year that they're active and the length of their tongues. So if you can have different flower shapes and sizes, you're supporting so many more than just having one or two flowers that only cater to a certain number. Also blooms from early spring to late fall. I've got a picture here of a willow and on the left and that's a fantabulous fabulous shrub to have in the springtime. It's a wonderful help for our early uh, waking uh, pollinators in this blood root to the right of that. And on the top, we've got a, um, a mountain hollyhock and one of our verbenas and uh, a pasque flower. Below that, we've got wild columbine, but many beautiful species of native columbine in Canada and one of our wild lilies. So on that note, it's great to include some regionally native plants. Um, our, our wildlife has co-evolved co -evolved with these plants. So again, if you can have regionally native plants, you're supporting your local and migratory wildlife that are used to feeding from them. So on that note, a little bit more about native plants before we get to the next food group. 
Here we have clockwise uh, blue flax, swamp rose mallow, one of our native spireas, false sunflower, cardinal flower, New England aster at the bottom in the middle, uh, wild geranium, beautiful shade loving plant. And then there's swamp milkweed. And in the middle, we have um, a fragrant sumac. Now, benefits of native plants, there are many because as I kind of mentioned there, the critical food source needed by certain wildlife monarchs have to have milkweed for their young. Otherwise we don't have monarchs. Connor blue butterflies, there's a similar story, only their food source lupins got extirpated. They got sort of wiped out from Southern Ontario. So did the butterfly become, you know, non-existent. They're still around, but they're not in Canada anymore. Also, native plants typically have the required nutrients needed by wildlife. So it's great to have a hummingbird feeder if you want to supplement the food, but if you can have the flowers, that's what nature naturally has designed and provided with the right uh, nutrients for wildlife. Uh, Doug telling me uh, mentions of a study done in terms of birds and fruit of some native shrubs versus their non-native equivalents in, in, in Europe and found that our native ones have the right proportion of fat to sugar that our birds needed for overwintering and migrating. So many subtleties to discover still about nature. So again, if you can have locally, regionally native seeds and plants, that's best. Typically they require less maintenance. I don't say that absolutely though, because there's still some that might, but generally speaking, they can be much easier to, to look after, especially if they're sited in the, the correct location. Okay, moving on to another food category, we've got mud puddling and tree sap for certain species of butterflies. Mud puddling is when they go to wet or damp earth, compost and manure or sand, natural sand, not the sterilized kind, and they, they get minerals from, from them. Um, you can do this a few different ways. I, I like to have mulch in a lot of my beds because it helps in many ways, which I'll get to later, but it's nice to have some exposed as well. It helps ground nesting bees. And in this case, it helps with butterflies that want to mud puddle. I remember once I created a new garden and I put some lovely fresh compost on it and like sheep's, sheep's manure even, I think it was. And I wet it, watered the plants in. And oh my gosh, I came back, I don't know, 10 minutes later and it was covered in butterflies, multiple species. It was quite lovely. I've never seen anything quite that dramatic since, but it definitely is helpful. If you don't want to do that, or if you can't do that, there's some examples there of some dishes you can make with some sand. And um, of course you create something yourself as a bit more maintenance involved. So if a, you know, after a rain, you're gonna to have to tip out the excess water that gets dry, you'll have to add more water. But it's kind of fun. If you've got a young one in your life or the young one in you, you can draw in the sand. Like I drew it the sun in one of those dishes just to be fun. And just to illustrate another point, you never know when you're gonna come across a butterflies being opportunistic. The bottom left is I discovered a question mark butterfly and that's the parking lot at work. And there's obviously a couple of cracks in, cracks in, the, in the concrete and, and there's some earth filling it in. And there was a butterfly taking advantage of that spot after a rain and getting some nutrients. Okay, so moving along, another category of food or leaves, as mentioned before, some species absolutely have to have specific leaves. So monarchs and milkweed, there's in the middle a uh, black swallowtail, and they've adapted to eat parsley, as in this picture from my garden, but they also go to Queen Anne's lace, which is a non-native plant, but it is naturalized and considered beneficial by many, um, but it can spread, so it can be problematic depending on the area you're in but also um, it's native plant that it feed on are golden alexanders. There's a couple of species in Canada, Western version, like Eastern version. And on the far right is a red admiral on a golden uh, flowering current bush, beautiful bush. And on um, the top you see the, the picture of the nettles they feed on. And I know a lot of people go, oh my God, nettles, I hate nettles, they sting. And yes, they do, but there are ways to have them in your garden where you do not get stung by them. I actually have always grown them because they are a complete protein, very nutritious, full of all kinds of minerals and such. So I grow it to dry and have as tea. And I've always had them, even when my daughter and I would play in the garden and she knew where they were. So we never got close enough to have a problem. And I've learned how to harvest them without getting stung. And if you do decide to grow some or let some grow, if you have a wild patch already on your property, 
You can also dry them and make a tea for your plants. It's very good fertilizer. And you can add it to your compost. Very, very good to help things there. Okay, so that's the first category food. The rest are much, much shorter, I promise. So water can be a simple saucer or a fancy dish, and you can change that. Not all beneficial insects and pollinators go to that, but some will. Keep your dishes clean, especially when it gets really hot. You can use perching stones. So these little creatures have a place to, to, to perch and, and get the water without you know, having to go in. And hummingbirds love a mist. I'm told this, I've never actually seen it. So if ever you do it and you discover uh, this for yourself, I'd love to see a picture, I'd love to hear about it. But I've been told that because I like the sort of like the damp, humid weather, if you take a hose and you'd have it on the mist setting and you prop it up in the, the crook of a tree, and the same time every day for let's say five minutes, you turn it on. If there are hummingbirds in the area, um, they're known to be observant enough and get used to that and then they'll come and visit at that time. So that's food, water, now shelter, like us, they need it as cover for the elements. And like us, perhaps they need it as protection from predators, um, nesting and resting spots, a place to finish their development. Some of these creatures have multiple stages as eggs and then, and then and larvae and then and as their adult form. And then also as perches to, to spy their next meal. They need to hunt. Shelter can come in the form of all kinds of plants, plant parts. So for instance, trees and shrubs, evergreen that keep their, their needles in the winter and deciduous that lose their leaves. Vines can add more layers to, to fences and whatnot. Dense herbaceous vegetation like ferns, grasses and perennials. That's great cover. And uh, I mentioned earlier about the fireflies. They like the, the, the damp um, and, and the, the, the taller vegetation for them. Tree stumps and logs are also great. Um, you know, I've been walking in the woods and a fallen log full of little holes and little, again, you could think they're little flies, but they're not. Little bees, small carpenter bees looking for, for homes. Other, aspect, other elements or are, um, types of shelter rather, open area of sand or earth for ground nesting bees. A lot of our bees are ground nesters. Uh, leaf litter, that's really important um, because there are many species of butterflies and moths that, for instance, will finish their development in the leaf litter. They'll drop the leaf down at the leaf litter. And if it's just hard ground with bare lawn, they don't really have much of a chance. Whereas if you have leaf litter below the tree, if you have allowed it to stay below the tree, they've got more of a chance. And some people have more countryfied gardens than others, larger gardens than others. Sometimes it can be challenging in a small garden. I know I have one right now and it was easier when I had a larger space. But again, you can, you can simply break your leaves if you want to the tree line to create sort of a nice edge. And um, you can grow spring ephemerals, which are native plants that naturally grow in woodland kind of environments. They're the ones that come, they flower out before the leaves come out and take advantage of all the sunlight reaching the forest floor. They can be quite lovely to grow underneath these trees. Um, leaf litters are so super important if you can keep that in mind. Obviously, you all have to do what's best for you. If you have too many leaves, you may need to take some away, but keep them in mind when you do manage your leaves. Stone piles, great for, for other critters that need to make homes in there. Plant stems. If you have plant stems that are hollow and they're broken such that they, the, the, the edge is open, then you might find that you've got some, some, uh, some bees nesting in there because some of them will go to different, different branches that do that. So when you clean up in the spring or in the fall, keep that in mind. If you do have some branches or some stems and you see that they are open, maybe don't trim them um, uh, below, you know, a foot and a half, I'm told, is roughly kind of a, a ballpark figure. So that in case there are any nesting in there, you may stay safe. And insect hotels, I know people wanna make insect hotels and that's great, but I've been told that there's research showing that the larger they are, the more problematic they can be in terms of attracting the non-native species and parasitic species. And while it's true, we naturally do have some parasitic species, it's almost like making the odds that much harder for native bees to, to cope with that because it's like a big red flag saying, here I am, here I am. So what people are suggesting now is much smaller homes. And I know one fellow who's a wasp expert and has a really neat system of some long pieces of wood with a very long um, drill bit, like a five inch drill bit, drilling a long hole in there and bundling them up and placing them around the garden so that um, they have a place to stay, but it's, it's more discreet. 
on that note, tips for solitary bee nesting, leave some sunny areas bare for ground nesters. If you have mulch, um, no areas without mulch are good, but if you have mulch, I suggest um, very finely shredded mulch. That's easier for them to get into um, if, if they can. Pithy stems, as mentioned, um, I think elderberry is one, sumac, raspberry, you might even find some of your perennials can be like that. Uh, wood, leaving tree stumps and logs. If you have an insect hotel, keep it dry, place it in the sun off the ground or, or in a dry spot on the ground. Keep the entrance clear. One of the end uh, needs to be closed. Avoid uh, glass or plastic because of the condensation can create mold and you need probably to you know, change them out every couple of years. So together, the food, water, and shelter create spaces, much like rooms and furniture, create places in our own homes for different people and different activities. So you're adding lovely layers to your garden when you can do this. So now you put those elements in, now you wanna keep it safe. So we're gonna go through those just briefly. Um, first one is avoiding pesticides. And some of you might say, well, how do I do that? If you work with nature, actually, you can really get a lot out of it. So growing a diversity of plants is one trick. Because if you have like a monoculture, it's almost again like a, a big flag saying, hi, I'm over here. So if you have a bunch of different plants uh, together, not only are they not necessarily going to be one big uh, attractant to potential pests, but they're also going to attract other species, which will help to keep things in check. Strengthen your plants with soil amendments like compost. Strengthen them by planting them in the right spot. It's been shown that insects do know how to spot weaker plants and will tend to go to those. So try to keep your plants thriving and healthy. And of course, attract allies in general, like bats and birds, uh, toads, snakes, beneficial insects, because they will help keep those potential species in check. There's a yellow spotted salamander there. And earlier in the presentation was a blue spotted salamander that was from my garden. I actually found a few of them in my garden. I was amazed. One of them was in pine needle mulch that was naturally under some pine trees I had. Another one was uh, between some rocks in a layer of rocks that I had as like a rock wall edging to a garden bed. And another one was under a tarp in the fall, all, all discovered by accident because um, they're very secretive creatures, but they're, they're all very helpful too. And if you do need to do something, well, just try water as a spray. If that doesn't work, add some environmentally friendly soap. If that doesn't work, you might want to add a bit of garlic, but start gentle and then increase as the need is, is, uh, is there. Compost is a fantastic thing to have in your garden to make, to use. It's very nourishing. It can improve the soil. If you've got very sandy soil, it can bind it a bit more, help it hold more moisture. If you've got hard pan clay, it can help loosen it up. It provides all kinds of nutrients. Uh, and of course, in general, for us as taxpayers, it saves money because if to site a new landfill once it's full, it's extremely expensive. And it also means using up more beautiful wild spaces, chopping them down and putting our garbage there instead. Also, the more organics we send to landfill, the more leachate can be created, which is a toxic material, which then has to be caught and processed. And compost is free. It's called gardener's gold. And perhaps a lot of you already know about this, but for those of you that don't, I highly recommend trying it. It doesn't necessarily smell. If you layer your greens and your browns together, um, it, it can keep things intact. In it can support and nourish the organisms that are breaking it down. Um, I'll, I'll include a link um, in the email following uh, to give you more information about this. Conserving water is also really great. If you can have rain barrels that catches the water that you can use for your gardens, I recommend more for ornamental gardens versus your edible gardens. Um, I remember one time we were going through a drought and then all of a sudden the water came, the rain came and filled up my rain barrel. But of course I noticed this, this um, film, really greasy film on it. You know, chemicals from the, the shingles were on the water. So just brought it home to me. This is more for my flowers and whatnot. Um, unless of course you've got like shale roofs or tin roofs, but keep that in mind. You might also want to have a cover for your rain barrel because sometimes animals get thirsty and they go in and they can't get out. So have like a cover. Also you can keep the mosquitoes out too uh, from breeding in your, in your rain barrel. It's best to water in the morning and at the base of plants because then the base of plants, the water goes to the roots as opposed to all over the plant, which it doesn't necessarily need and can sometimes be a problem. So during the sun, the water droplets can magnify the sun sometimes and can cause problems on the plant. Sometimes if you water the whole plant in the evening, uh, it can create um, sort of mildew problems. And again, use native and drought tolerant species to cope with minimal water. 
Um, earth friendly gardening mulch. Yeah, so mulch is another great one. I um, love mulch because it conserves moisture. It helps keeps the weeds down and whatever weeds do pop through, I can pull up fairly easily, returns nutrients to the soil when you use the organic kinds, um, minimizes soil erosion, and it helps with the soil temperature. So the roots of the plant can handle the intense heat a little bit more easily. I highly recommend avoiding dyed mulch. We don't know the impacts of this coloring going into the soil and affecting all our soil organisms. Um, and I, I, again, if you're gonna mulch, aim for finely shredded so it's easier for beneficial insects to navigate in, if possible. Um, green lawn care is another one, of course, grass cycling. You're gonna cut your lawn, leave your grass clippings, clippings where they lie. Generally speaking, if you've got enough or beneficial organisms in your soil, they will be broken down in a relatively short period of time. If you haven't cut your lawn for you know, two months and you've got grass this tall, you might have a problem there. But generally speaking, with regular maintenance, you can usually leave it on the lawn. And then the nutrients go down to the earth and nourish your grass roots. We encourage minimal lawn. Everyone has to decide for themselves what's right for them. But if you can think of all your lifestyle needs for entertaining, you know, dog running on the grass, playing with your child, kicking the ball around, et cetera, anything that's not needed beyond that, be great to fill the plants and add this habitat for our wildlife. And if you're good at water, um, it, we, we don't water our, our lawn at, 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 uh, at work with the, the demonstration gardens. And yes, during the really hot spells, it does go brown, but it comes right back. Um, of course, if you do wish to, lawn, to water your lawn, uh, then just water really deeply. Watch how much rain you get and then water really deeply because then the water goes down, down, down. Because even if, you, if your grass blade is this tall, usually your, your root is equally tall or deep. So you want the water to go down, down, down. And often we think it's down low enough, but you want it to go right down to the bottom of the root. So it encourages the roots to stay down there as opposed to coming back up, looking for water, um, and then they can get scorched by the, the heat and the sun. So something to keep in mind. Now, that said, putting it all together, pollinator gardens can be all kinds of sizes and shapes. We have one top left in a larger space. Um, top right is more of an urban space. The bottom right is actually a very tiny little space in a condo complex. And the people that, that, that shared this picture, they have all kinds of creatures, birds and butterflies and whatnot in their garden. And um, it's amazing what you can do with a little space. And then the bottom left is a community garden. So we're going to show a bit more about gardens now because garden habitat certification is when you do these principles of you know, have food, water, and shelter in your space. And if you do um, uh, avoid pesticides, then you can apply for garden habitat certification, in which case your property is denoted as wildlife friendly habitat. So you can see from these pictures all kinds of sizes and styles. This one here is incredibly beautiful Toronto garden. Um, beautifully landscaped, it's got all the features. So it can be extremely tidy. And I love this picture because it showed people it does not have to be messy. But then people thought, oh my gosh, well, I can't afford that. That's really intense. So then we said, it can be anything. And so I'm gonna show people again, it can be a corner yard. It can be a little strip of lawn. Um, it can be just a tiny little area in your front garden. If your garden is only small, a lot of these new, new builds have very, very, very tiny spaces. So if that's all you've got, that's okay. It can still be really, really beneficial and helpful to our pollinators. Every bit helps. And again, year-round interest, year-round support um, in terms of, you know, thinking of birds in the winter, but you can have visual interest year-round too, depending on what plants you, you grow. And here's another beautiful one from out west and one of our certified properties. Again, beautifully done, all the different elements. And another example here. And I just like to show different pictures because it shows you that you know, any style goes, any budget, anyone can do this, any level of interest, any style you have, it's all, all works. And um, on the bottom right, I love that that's, um, it was, uh, I can't remember the name, it was just a business or it was a municipality. And they just had that little bit along the sidewalk to plant and they had great fun doing it. And they, they're, they're, their area is certified. So more certified properties, again, large, large areas and teeny tiny little properties, all helping. And when you do certify your garden, you help us visually demonstrate our collective impact. We add to a map um, and a little pin that shows approximately where you are. It doesn't, it doesn't, um, you know, 
show exactly where you are so you're, you previously is kept safe. We hope that this will motivate others to take action so we can watch our wildlife habitat grow. And when you do get certified, you're eligible to buy a sign. Currently, the two signs we have are on the left and you can see different ways people have, have um, put them in their garden different ways to hang them, different ways to, to attach them. So there's a variety of resources to share with you. We have our wildlife friendly demonstration gardens, which if you're ever in the Ottawa area in Canada, you're very welcome to come and walk around. We have a website, which perhaps you already know about, um, CanadianWildlifeFederation.ca, and my program is the Guardian for Wildlife program. We have a newsletter you can sign up for, Grow Wild. Native Plant Encyclopedia, Native Plant Supplier List, different resources to help you learn more about plants and animals. We have print materials, posters and handouts, and some of them you can download even as well. And actually here's our pollinator poster behind me. We have a Facebook page uh, we wanna join and chat and share that way. iNaturalist is something that the Canadian Wildlife Federation is a part of. And um, we have our own group called the or project, Gardening for Wildlife. And what you can do is you can share your observations from your garden of your wild species that visit and any native plants that you have growing there. And iNaturalist is a really neat a resource because you can actually find a lot on there. You can learn a lot already there. If you're not sure about a species is, you can upload it and there are people that will help you identify it. And you're actually also doing citizen science. You're helping scientists because they're watching and seeing what species are being noted in different places and it can help them keep track of populations and if a new species is discovered. So it's really helpful for, for them. And just a few more examples of different projects going on around the country. You can start one yourself if you want to help people help you figure out all the different moths of Canada or you know the maple trees of Toronto for instance. It's all, all there. So you can discover all kinds of things about your wild neighbors by joining your local field naturalist club, exploring iNaturalist, go to a nearby park. Um, there's a lot of other great resources that you can, you can tap into. And if you want to stay connected with the Canadian Wildlife Federation, there are different ways. I've got both ways listed if you want to actually go to the actual URL on the left and, and um, uh, another way of writing it on the right. And um, again, this is being recorded. You're going to send a copy. I haven't got to write it all down. So you will get to look at this again when you get the replay sent to you. So I wish you all very, very happy gardening. And like that's enough of me talking about this. I'm going to go to the Q&A now to see what questions you guys have had. Okay. A list of good native pollinator plants for Quebec. And actually, I'm going to add right now, we've got some great webinars lined up this spring. A wonderful one, Heather Holm, an expert on bees and wasps with beautiful photography, great researcher. She's gonna be talking April 11th about wasps. And when you're talking about native pollinator plants for Quebec, we've got a terrific lady who's gonna do one on um, Quebec native plants, but she'll talk about design as well, which is applicable to anyone across the country. We've got someone from BC talking, also using BC plants, but also design elements from across the country. Different sort of, um, different fortes. So we're going to hear some wonderful tips from them. So check out our web webinars upcoming and I will send the link so you can check that out. So I highly recommend you tune into that webinar for the pollinator plants for Quebec. And the gardens, yes, they can be visited. The gardens uh, around our headquarters in Canada can definitely be visited. And um, if you want to give me a heads up, you're very welcome to and I'll see if myself or a gardener have time to, to speak with you when you're walking around. Someone's asking, do you have a rough estimate for how many are bees in Canada are solitary nesting compared to social? Hmm. Um, in terms of species, I'm not sure, but I'm gonna get back to you on that in, um, in the email. I'll do my very best to, to figure that out for you with the experts that we have uh, um, on our team. Okay, so the difference between a wasp and a hornet Oh my gosh, that's another really good question. And I'm actually gonna have to defer that to Heather Holm. I have her books. Um, and if I can get the answer to you in the email, I will happily do that. I always have to stop and think for myself with the wasps, all the difference, all the differences, because um, that's not my forte. But thank goodness we have an expert coming on 
April 11th. So I promise we'll get you an answer to that. If not in my email, definitely on the on the 11th. Um, that one I'm afraid will not be recorded and posted. If you register for it, you will get access to the recording for a few days and then it will come down, but it will only be to those who register. So keep that in mind when you check out our webinars, look to see if it's gonna be recorded or not. Recorded meaning recorded and posted to our website. What about close neighbors who spray near the pollinator garden? Oh yes, that's such a challenge. <laughs> so many of us often shake our heads like, how do you have those conversations with your neighbors without upsetting them? How do you have that opening line? And I've been listening to all kinds of people who've been in this field for so long and no one has the absolute perfect answer. It's always something you've got to constantly feel out. And I know one person with her neighbors, she will start conversations, letting them know in, when there are opportunities of what cool things she has in her garden, why she likes having them in her garden. And it's gently sown the seed that way. And then whenever she has extra native plants that she thinks that neighbor might like, she actually even shares them with the neighbor. I don't know if your neighbor's that open-minded or not. Maybe there's something you wanna do in your neighborhood and contact your municipality or your local master gardeners or your local horticultural group. Perhaps they could get information in the community newspapers, or perhaps you have um, an e-newsletter that goes out to your community. You never know what your neighbor is reading or listening to. So perhaps you can get them information that way as well. But yeah, that is a really a tricky one. I personally get excited by a lot of these creatures. And when I talk to people about it, I think they can feel that. And so maybe if you ever have a conversation with them about why you find them amazing and important and fascinating, you can meet them where they're at and then inspire them along from there, um, which is the most positive, gentle way to do it that I know of and perhaps the most impactful down the line. It may not be the quickest or easiest, but anyway, food for thought. I'm having trouble finding native lily seeds. Can you suggest where I can find them? Well, we have a native plant supplier list. I don't know who sells what, um, but I, I would send that to you and then you can start with the ones that are near you um, and call around and, and email and see if anyone there can help you out. Because yes, we've got several species of lilies that are so beautiful. I used to know someone near the Ottawa area that grew them, but he's not doing that anymore. So even myself, I have to, have to look around to see where I can find them. Should insect hotels be cleaned out each fall? I, okay, this is where it gets funny because it, there's so many different species that could come to your insect hotel. And a lot of these different species have different um, life cycles and timing as to when they nest and when they're active. So I personally find it really tricky. I like to do things as natural as possible. So I'm not doing much maintenance um, and interfering. If you find that, like people do suggest, for instance, replacing the, the items, whether they're, the, whether they're hollow sticks, uh, stems, or whether it's wood with drilled holes, replacing them every one or two years, but definitely check to see if you can see anyone in there or not. And if not, then replace. But if you're not sure if it still looks like it's plugged up, then I would leave it. Um, and when you say cleaning out, I would just like replace the materials because typically speaking, they say it's best to not have things that would be clean like, like glass or plastic. But I think that's what you're referring to. Okay, how much should we, um, how much mulch should we put? How thick? That's a good question. And it depends again on what you're trying to accomplish. So if you're doing it for the sake of your plants and maintaining the moisture and keeping the weeds down, I know people that put you know, many centimeters to many inches down. It really depends, I suppose, if you have some really tenacious grassy weeds in your area that you need to keep down. Um, if you find your weeds are quite tame, you may not need anything so deep. So I don't have an absolute answer for that. If you, Because again, if you're thinking for the ground nesting bees, they don't want it very thick. It might even be hard to navigate, even fine mulch. So. I don't know if there's any studies out there on that. I'm not sure myself. So um, if it's just for your plants, I would go for a thick layer, you know, several centimeters, even or even if, you know, a few inches worth, if, if you can do that. And some people use as mulch also um, aged manure and compost, as opposed to shredded bark, for instance, or, or shredded straw. So if you do that, then you can probably get away with a you know, fairly thick layer again, and then you'll still have actually um, the ability for pollinators to dig into that. 
What suggestions would you have for a water supply for pollinators like a plate with rocks in it for public places like a city park? Mm. Concern about plates and burbesque going missing. It's a very good question. Yeah, city parks. We've have had, 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 we have had some community gardens get certified with us and to get certified, they have to have the water element. And sometimes they might just wanna have the element of the damp soil because then some of the butterflies can get their, their water that way. Um, that might be the best route for a public place. Um, unless for instance, you're in an area where you've got the municipality involved and you've got a lot of the neighbors involved and it's such a community feel that the scales are tipped, that people are more mindful and watchful and careful and, and caring, that there's less chance of that happening. Um, you, you may want to put a, a dish in that's like a really, really heavy uh, concrete bird bath, for instance. And if, if it's shallow enough for the birds, that's fine. And at one end, you can have a couple of stones there. That might be an option. And is cold food invasive? I heard mixed things about this plant. I have to research that. Um, I'm not sure. I, being national, I tend to, to research a variety of things and I don't have, I have, have checked with multiple invasive councils lists, but I can't remember about cold sweat. So I'll get back to you on that one. And actually what I can even do is include to you some links for invasive species councils across the country. And then you guys can have that, to, or you can research and look it up yourself invasive plant councils, invasive species councils. Um, most provinces have them. Uh, and then I think there's one in a national one you can check out as well. I have a biological desert of sugar bush. Any suggestions for what to grow? Hmm. A biological desert of sugar bush. I'm not even sure what you mean by sugar bush. I'm not sure if I should be embarrassed that I don't know what you mean by sugar bush or if that's a specific, specific term. Um, oh, sugar bush. Do you mean like maple trees for sugar bush? Of course, for tapping maples. Of course, I know that term. I'm in Lanark County. I know sugar bush. Um, okay, so biological desert. Well, I'm surprised to be a biological desert because usually in like the maple woods uh, forest, you still do have a lot of the wildflowers that come out in the spring, the spring ephemerals that, you'll, that will pop through the, the dried maple leaves of the year before. You'll have things like um, hepatica. Spring Beauty, Trout Lilies. Um, there's a bunch of others too. The Trilliums, the white Trilliums and the, and the beautiful red Trilliums. So they would usually be growing there and they do support our pollinators. So I'm not sure if what you have has been um, um, changed in any way, but if not, like ch check to see in the early spring if you do have them, because that would be something to be aware of. Um, and um, you know, speaking of, of maples, um, red maples, I don't know if you have red maples nearby or not, but they are actually also having flowers that are, you know, pollinated by our, our native bees too. Okay, what are the steps to have a certified wildlife-friendly garden? That's a very good question. It used to be um, where the forms were sent to my colleague, but now as for the past year or so, it's been automated. And so I can send you the link that you would go to to fill out the form. And uh, in the past, we would have pictures shared, um, uploaded. It's currently not able to take pictures, but we're working on that. And so hopefully we'll hopefully be able to get the pictures back because it's wonderful to see pictures. It helps us really see what you're doing. And they're wonderful if you give us permission to share them too for presentations such as this. I'll give you more guys my email address. So you're always welcome to send pictures too. Is there a list of native plants for each province? Um, well, actually, our native plant encyclopedia is searchable in different ways. There are two tabs. One's a basic tab and one is a detailed tab. And you can click on your province and you can click on the plant type, whether it's a tree, shrub, perennial, for instance. You can click on the season you want it to bloom or the wildlife you want to attract, the color of the flower. So it, you can play with it and you can get a list that way. And it may not be you know, completely comprehensive, but there will, you will get lots and lots of options to explore. And then from there, you can see well which ones suit my habitat of my garden, the growing conditions of my garden. And then also what can I get locally from a nursery or order from relatively nearby nurseries. So yeah, I'll we'll send that link for sure. I heard that wasps, yellow jackets are a pest later in the season when they're looking for a lot of food, but earlier in the season, they're not a pest and provide pollinator services. Yeah, they'll often come to like our sugary foods and whatnot, um, a lot of people find. And, um, 
I threw different theories for that. Sometimes they say it's because there's less food, less uh, flour for them to go to. Um, I'm not exactly sure, but again, Heather Holm would be a perfect person to ask that question to. If you're able to sign up for that webinar, that would be great. Um, I'll do my best to try to get an answer for that anyhow. I know the so support schools and children, child care centers in Ontario to start pollinator gardens. Does it also support individual gardeners wanting to start their own pollinator gardens? I'd love to, but we don't know. Being in that, a charitable organization, we do have to watch our funding and that would be a bit too much, but it would be wonderful. Um, years ago, we did actually help with community planting as well as senior gardens, but um, um, we actually have now a program where we have an intergenerational program with seniors and youth. And so plants are provided for those activities uh, in certain cases, but um, no, I'm sorry, we don't have big plants, but uh, check out our native plant supplier list and see if you can get, get a good nursery near you and maybe even neighbors to share. And if you ever participated in the CD Saturday, some of those have the native plants as well that you guys can share amongst each other. I'm also located in Quebec, got to know Board of Ontario. Would there be any difference for native plants? Yeah, because we're so close to where I am and it's very, very similar. Like when I'm hiking in, in, in the Gatineau's, um, the blood of the plants there are very similar to what's on our side. Um, it, it, really, again, it's, it's um, not about the political areas, the geographical area. And so a lot of these native plants can be found in quite a wide area. Some a very small specialized area like Carolinian Canada. And some of them are quite widespread. So a lot of Quebec and Ontario plants are very similar because we have very similar habitats and, and similar um, zone. Oh, thank you, Kathy. Great presentation. Thanks for doing this. Can okay, we get mice? Oh, how can we ethically manage that? Yes, I've had that problem too. One of the things I can suggest is that mice can sometimes come when we're feeding birds bird seed. And I love doing that. My mother loves seeing them too. But um, what I tend to do more now is just I plant for the birds. I leave my perennials to go to seed and, I, and those seed heads will actually feed a lot of birds. I'll see juncos and finches and whatnot and chickadees go to those seed heads in the winter. So that's one way to discourage mice. Um, there's, there's not too much more to do beyond that. I mean, people say for different animals, of course, make sure your garbage is fully contained. Um, compost, if you've got composters, um, make sure that they're, they're very active, that they're hot enough, that they're decomposing things quickly so you get your layers of your browns and your greens so that your organisms have the food they need to do their job as quickly as possible. Um, yeah, tricky situation and I wish you well with that. I'm sorry, did you mention a webinar on pollinator plants for Ontario? Well, actually last year we had a whole series of, of native plants for different areas in the country. Uh, some of them we were allowed to record and put up and some of them not. Um, the Ontario one, we were not able to keep up. Um, we, I wasn't able to get someone for Quebec last year, so I was very glad to get one, someone this year. They'll also be doing it in French too, which is super. But for pollinator plants in Ontario, again, I recommend our native plant encyclopedia. You put in Ontario, you put in the fact you want pollinators to be supported and you'll get a whole bunch of, of ideas. There's also another uh, native plant database, which I recommend called, it used to be called canplant.ca and um, it's got a different name now, but I'll include that link as well for you guys. I leave my plant stems up through the winter. At one point in the spring, should I be able to cut them down? Yeah, see, that's a very good question. Because again, there's so many species of bees and we're still discovering so much about them. And so it's hard to know. I really have a hard time knowing. What has been recommended to me by the experts such as Heather Holm is you, le you leave the old stems up a certain height and the leaves will grow up soon enough once spring starts. And I have seen this myself in the garden, the, the leaves do grow up. Um, if the stems are solid and there's no hole, I think it's safe then to remove them because there's no chance of anyone in there. The fact that you don't see any hole, any access point, then it's, I think it's pretty safe to assume there is not a nest in there. But if you see it's a plant where it's hollow, there's a hole at the top and you're not sure, I would leave it as long as possible. Um, yeah, and, and then late, as late in the spring as you're comfortable, I suppose, if, if you do want to remove them. I know, for instance, with mulch too, people say, well, when do I, I want to remove the leaves from my bed. I've left them all winter, but I want to remove them. We say, if you can't leave them year round, 
then remove them as late as possible in the spring. When the temperature's warmed up enough, that is like, I think around 10 degrees um, during the day and even maybe at nighttime. And that's when it's warm enough that a lot of these creatures like the hummingbird clearing moth will have finished its, its cycle and will be able to fly as, as a mature adult. Are Japanese beetles beneficial in any way? Mm, Denise, you know what? I think everything on this planet has its benefit and its role to play. But I know Japanese beetles have been a real problem because they're not native to here and there's that imbalance. And a lot of people are definitely doing what they need to do there. A lot of them are squishing them or they're, they're having soap traps for them. Um, so there are ways to deal with them without using harsh chemicals but people that I know of still feel the need to, to, to deal with them. So I'm sorry, I don't have a perfect answer for that. Oh, 70% of bees are brown nesters. Yes, around, around three quarters of them are. I'm not sure if the other question was referring to, to the, um, the, the, number of, the number of species, but if you're looking for percentages, yes, of course, about 70% of, of our bees are ground nesters. Um, uh, when planting a pollinator garden, is it recommended to plant native to your area plants, or plant Canada native plants as well? Are there pollinating plants we should not plant together? So that's a good question. I think one should be mindful of having some native plants to your area for sure, because some, some animals are specialists. They need certain species of golden water, they need a certain group of plants to feed from. Um, and some of them are generalists. They can go to a whole wide variety of, of, of plants or flowers for their nectar and pollen. So I like to have regionally native plants where possible, but there are definitely some native plants to Canada that I like to have that I, that I, that I know are generally beneficial. They're not gonna be invasive to my area and I include them in my garden as well. So um, let's think of an example of that one. Um, I can't think of an example right now, but I definitely have got some regionally native and some, and I even have some non-native ones, but they're, they're beneficial non-native ones. They're not invasive, they're not gonna take over. They're organically grown, they're heirloom. I have zinnias and, and cosmos in my garden. I grow them from seed and I have them in the garden and the pollinators go to them and even hummingbirds go to the zinnias. And then when they make the seeds, the birds will go, the goldfinches will go to the cosmos and other birds will go to the zinnias. So those I don't mind having. So it's, native plants are very important to consider, but it's not the end of the world if you don't. And if you do have a plant that is your favorite plant and it is sterile, if, mo if you have a large enough garden and most of your plants are fertile, then that I don't think is a problem because you have balanced it with, um, with uh, many native fertile plants or fertile plants. Okay, how are we doing for time here? Um, I'll just finish up a few more and then, and then the rest, I'll see if I can answer in an email. Any ideas to keep chipmunks from eating them? <laughs> no, oh my, oh my goodness, keeping animals at bay. It's like, you've got to keep trial and error because what works for some animals in one area may not work for that group of animals in another area. Sometimes you can have fur of predator species like a dog and that will work. Um, sometimes it won't. Sometimes you can have very uh, strong smelling uh, plants growing around it, like onions and, and herbs and whatnot. And sometimes that doesn't work. So sometimes people have to resort to, to fencing of some kind. So yeah, I know we just gotta keep trying different things that work for our area. And if anyone else has ideas, please do share in the chat. Um, Cause I will be looking at the chat afterwards and I'll take whatever I can from that for the email that follows. Okay, yes, need to plant suppliers for sure. I'll send them a long season. Okay, and um, okay, <laughs> yes, I was wondering, Natasha. Thanks. Okay, we do have a website resource list you can send. Yeah, I'll send all the all the all the links from our website that I can think of, and any others beyond that that I think would be useful for you. And I'll be sending it actually to the group. Um, I'll give myself a couple of two, I don't, I'm not sure how many days it'll take for me to get the email ready. Um, and then I'll send it to the whole group. Everyone who is registered for this email will get them. Can you add pink salt and sugar to those sand rock water dishes for insects? Hmm. I would just stick to the typical medium 
depths of soil manure compost and sand maybe you can because a lot of people do feel they are going mainly for the salts in terms of minerals i don't know how that would impact them or not i mean I suppose you could experiment pink salt is meant to be the pure himalayan salt but i don't know i've even heard that there are heavy metals in a lot of them um, that, that we don't even realize so i'm not even sure if that's a good idea or not sugar i would definitely not I, I would avoid sugar. Sugar is usually refined. It's something that is not as beneficial to our pollinators. Um, although I know we have sugar water feeders and that's another category, but I am not sure about that. And you're very welcome. Oh, my sugar bush gets a lot of deer traffic that eat everything. Um, yeah, interesting. There should still hopefully be a lot of spring ephemerals on the ground, but I'm not sure if they're eating everything I'm surprised they're eating all the spring ephemerals too. And in which case I really wouldn't have any suggestions because um, what to put in a sugar bush that they're not gonna eat that would grow there naturally anyhow. Um, yeah, that's, I'll have to give that some thought but I can't think of anything offhand. Sorry, Monica. We wanna remind us about the iNaturalist Nature Challenge. Oh yes, last weekend of April. I will send the link for that. Um, my colleague James uh, works with that and I'll definitely be including a link for that for sure. Thank you for mentioning that, Wendy. There's a lot of great stuff on iNatural, so I really highly recommend you check it out. And this nature uh, challenge in all these different cities across the country, it's kind of fun. You get out and you see as much as you can and report as much as you can. And it's kind of a fun competition to see which city you can report the most. Our home has several peony plants. Are they good for pollinators? You know, there are so many kinds of peonies. Of peonies that I've ever grown, I've never seen pollinators on them. I've seen ants on them. And some people say that yes, ants can pollinate, but generally speaking, they're slow, slow going crawling from flower to flower that they're generally not, some people don't consider them pollinators. So if you're thinking of ants, I'm, you know, they help ants, um, not that ants are bad because it's definitely helping them. But in terms of the actual full on pollinators, I don't know. There could be some peony species that I've not experienced that they do go to, but I'm, I'm just not familiar with that myself. Laura says, a lot of my yard is shaded in by large spruce trees, which are staying. <laughs> Any suggestions for what to plant in the shade and under spruce trees? Yeah, it's, it's an awkward one and not a lot of options, particularly for pollinator type plants in Edmonton. I'm not sure of the range. You can look it up, but um, bunchberry is a cornice. It's one of the dogwoods. And instead of being like a shrub, it's, it's, a, it's, like a, it's a perennial on the ground. And um, beautiful white flower and then beautiful red berries and that grows in the shade and it grows in acidic coniferous type of environments. I'm not sure if it's native out in Edmonton but you can check our native plant encyclopedia and see. So that's a bunch berry. And then another plant that grows in the shade. I've seen it grow in so many different conditions. It might be okay under a spruce tree with acidity. I'm not sure. It's Canada anemone, another white flowering plant and if it's happy it will gradually spread spread not to the point where it's a problem invasive plant but it will just grow and you may just need to sort of you know tame that tame that little circle or oval of flowers over time but that's been another good shade loving one but i'll give some thought if i can think of any more and, and you're very welcome thank you i had japanese beetle infestation the past couple of years i set up traps that caught hundreds will it ever be rid of them honestly i don't know that's a question so many people are wondering it's really definitely been a challenge for most every gardener that I've ever ever spoken to, um, but I guess if you keep it up, keep it up, then you then you're not going backwards at least. But yeah, unfortunately, it's a lot of work there. Can we not cut the stems and leave them on the ground? That's a good point. That's a good thought. Possibly again, not knowing enough about all these different species and their life cycles. Once you cut them, um, the 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 uh, that end is now open, and I'm not sure if that leaves that end susceptible to a predator or not. But again, if that's what you're inspired to do to try, then, then I, would, I would try. Look and see what, what your gut is telling you about that stem. If you've left it for a long time um, and, and you've left it up for a long time and then you're ready to pull it off and you put it in the corner, that, you know, that's the best you can do, I think then go for it. I've used coffee grounds on my lilies to discourage red Japanese beetles. Rub the grounds upwards with your hands over the stem. Oh, thank you, Mary Jane. I'll copy this comment and put it in the email for people. Now we're getting quite late here, so I'm going to just um, wrap up. 
Oh, here we go. Bunch Berry is native to Alberta. Thank you, Karen, for sharing that. And that's our last question slash comment. So I'm going to stop here. And I'm going to thank you all so very much for, for joining me on this and for sharing so much. And um, like I say, check your inbox or maybe your spam or junk folder for a follow-up email in a few days with as many links as I can find uh, to help. And um, check out especially our upcoming uh, webinars because there's some really great ones lined up this spring. So thank you guys very, very much. And um, I'm just going to I'm just going to do a screenshot of the question so I have a copy of that for my records and then I'll shut the webinar down and I wish you all a really great evening. Take care. Bye bye.